Welcome everyone to today's social system mapping on ramp session for today, October 10th, 2022. We're so glad you could join us. Your hosts today, as usual, are me, Christine Capper, co-founder of SumMap and Greater Than the Sum, and Kara Martiner, who's our tech support and our producer, and does lots of other things with Greater Than the Sum. Um, what this is, briefly, it's a vision about a possibility that social system mapping um, can help intentional networks, change networks, become um, more uh, system savvy and effective and, and influential um, and more self-organizing more quickly. It's also a learning opportunity, an opportunity for you to learn about a little more about social system mapping, the theory, et cetera. Um, also for us to learn from you, it's a bilateral learning opportunity because it's, we're, this is one piece of a community of practice um, around social system mapping and sense making with social system mapping. And so social system mapping is the core of this community of practice, but not all of the people who are part of this community are mappers, or at least are not technicians who make maps. We have a lot of that, but we also have a lot, yeah, actually even more people who, who are here to help think about how to use a social system map into a community in, in a in a network or a change network um, how to introduce them and get them started how to um, continue to make sense of them and make them ever more useful so there's a lot of what you know adjacent possible sort of practices that feed into social system mapping and so um wherever your stance is you're welcome to be part of this community um, for today's agenda, uh, what we do is we have the um, the formal session is designed to be in uh, 60 minutes, so we'll go to the top of the hour. So we'll start with some really brief chat intros, and then I'm going to hand it over to Sarah, and Sarah's going to be um, the most person that you're talking with today. Um, and she'll be sharing her recently revamped map and some things she learned from sharing it at the annual um, revamp annual meeting a couple weeks ago. We'll have open it up for questions and answers. And then for those of you who are new to this um, way we do things, um, we have a formal hour and then I will stick around for an extra half an hour and I'm not sure if Sarah will or not, but um, if she does, that's great. Um, and anyone who wants to, who doesn't have another session, you know, another meeting right scheduled right after and is interested can stick around and then we just open it up. It can go in any direction. It's just a very informal. So if you've got some burning question you need to get answered that hasn't been addressed in this session, um, feel free to stick around or if you just want to chat or get to know people a little better, you're welcome to do that. So that's what we're going to be doing for the next hour and a half. Let's go ahead and jump into the chat intros. So this is just can just go into the um, the Slack chat, name, pronoun, location. Welcome, Eva Chavez from LA and Sarah, Mary. Jorge in the UK, Vicki in Washington, Gary in California, Nevada City, California, looks like, yep, Brian in California. We have some Californians and West Coasters, Tom in Richmond. Okay, next um, question for the chat is what's one primary network that you're part of or working with? Um, if that's an assumption on my part that you're part of a network because odds are if you weren't interested in networks you wouldn't be here you probably wouldn't have even come across our work and um so we want to know from you where you're who you're working with vicky nourishing networks donut economics brian sarah we know reamp network Various community coalitions, Pennsylvania and Missouri, focused on reducing youth substance use. And Scottish Social Sciences Network. I have a vague memory of someone 
contacting me about something that resonates with that. But um, local governance training, local governance and training, collective impact, promise neighborhood. Thank you all so much for, um, for both sharing what you're working on and for the work that you're doing in all of those contexts. We all know that uh, weaving change networks is part of um, how we need to approach organizing and planning for the future. And it's a sort of cutting edge, challenging work. And so um, thanks for being in it <laughs> and, for, and for, the, for the work that the networks are doing. Um, one last question for the chat. What brings you here today? What um, what made you pick this session or made you just be curious about this work overall? Sarah loves to share what she's been learning. <laughs> Support for learning. Systems. He's got curiosity about systems, tools, and mapping. Yep. Moving past theoretical to practical. That's a good one. Ongoing learning. learning. All right. Yes, yeah, Sarah's work is amazing. <laughs> Rebecca. And the practical side of systems tool for non-evaluators. Cool. Okay. So I'm going to move to the next. So um, we do, for those of you who are new to this context, we do um, something every Monday morning, same time, wherever you are um, at 10 o'clock. Yeah, same, duh. I just said that. Um, the first Monday of every month is a sense-making session. So we look at some piece of systems thinking, systems theory, and apply it to roughly to networks or to mapping or to the sort of the overlap, but we're using systems thinking kind of frameworks, mostly focused on human systems dynamics um, as, a, as the major systems thinking framework um, to dig deeper into our work as both as network weavers and as social social system mappers. So that's always happening on the first Monday of the month. The second Monday of the month, this session is specifically designed for what we call newbies, people who are not familiar with social system mapping, who have maybe never seen one, who have just sort of very fundamental questions like, what is this you are talking about? I just need to see one and, um, and ask some really fundamental questions. That's what this session is for. Um, this week, it's obviously it's Sarah Shanahan, who I'll introduce in just a moment. The third Monday of the month, we do a deep dive conversation, um, which is a little bit more. Um, but, so the first and the third Mondays, we kind of assume you've got some familiarity with social system mapping. It's not aimed at, you know, the total absolute newbie. Um, but of course, new people are welcome. It's just that some of the conversation might be a little bit uh, it, it'll make sense from the perspective of just knowing about life and people and systems and connections and stuff. But in terms of how it applies to social system mapping, you might some of that might be left out if you haven't already gotten a little bit of an introduction. But so those are, um, and this third Monday, especially those of you who've been around for a while and who sort of pop in and out every once in a while, um, I think this the 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 session we're going to do next Monday is going to be really interesting. There's a bunch of us who've been working with this great graphic designer, Sarah Raffo, for, I don't know, half a year more or more um, on understanding how social system mapping works, which is <laughs> very sort of abstract and complex. And, and you know, we've had several different uh, approach, you know, ways of looking at it and having these deep dialogues about what do we think this means? What do we think the potential is? How do we think that would work? And Sarah has distilled all of that down into um, a graphic, our first piece of graphic that is really designed to really help amplify this work. And she's gonna explain, share it with us next week in its not final, final form, but in enough of a final form to, to really get impact, uh, feedback and input about what's working, what's not working. Um, so we're gonna do that next week. And so those of you who, um, 
like I said, pop in and out every once in a while. I think you'll find this really both, we'll love to get your input into it and it will, I think you'll find it really interesting and valuable. So last bit from me, um, those of you who are new to this, how a social system map is made and how it works is basically there are two different software platforms. And I'm explaining this because the end result of a social system map for all the users feels like a single solitary platform. If it just feels like it's it's one thing. But if you're making a map and when you're designing a map, um, a fundamental thing to note is that there's two different platforms and there's different things happening in different platforms. And then they get, they get uh, uh, integrated together into one thing. So the, the one piece of this platform is SumApp, which is the tool that my partner and I uh, developed and continue to, to refine and develop, which is essentially a data gathering tool. So it's a fancy survey designed for this specific purpose. Um, and so the, you, you gather, you first you're gonna define what kind of data you wanna gather. So you define your survey, your connection questions, et cetera, in some app. And then as you start to, um, you gather data from your population, they can come in and change their data whenever they want. Um, they can continue to add to it. You can continue to add new, new members to it. It's not like a, a static thing that you shut it down at a certain point. And um, as the data starts to come in, then you link it into this really cool data visualization platform called Kumu. Kumu visualizes graph data, so nodes and lines. You see when you see dots and lines, that's a, it's called a graph. Uh, Kumu is a graph data visualization tool. So the data goes into Kumu, and then you can set up different views with different decorations and just different ways of slicing and dicing and sharing and, and looking at your data and making sense of the data. And then Kumu has a embed link. So we take the embed link from Kumu and put it back into its own tab in some app so that your users, they can input their data on one tab in some app and they can actually in, ex, interact with the map. It's not static. It's, an, it's still, it's almost as interactive as if you were making it in Kumu, um, but they can't break it. They can't delete any data or anything like that. And so they can interact with it in the, in the some app platform so that your users only see that one thing. So for those fundamental technical questions, that's how some app and Kumu work together. They're designed to be iterative, always able to change, add new, you know, tweak your questions, add more people, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's designed to be dynamic and accessible to everyone. So that's the simple fundamental uh, uh, foundation that you need to be at least know that much about. Okay, so today's map presenter, Sarah Ann Shanahan, has been, um, is one of my favorite people to work with in the world. <laughs> and um, she uh, has been, so the, the REAMP network, for those of you who are new to this work, the REAMP network is one of the most mature, intentional, uh, uh, targeted on a certain problem focused network in the United States. It's been around for, I'll let Sarah tell you, nearly 20 years. Um, all of the early network weaving books have REAMP as a case study. So you maybe have seen the, the, the name of the REAMP network and Sarah has worked with them for almost as long as the network has been there for her whole adult life. And so Sarah is like a deep, Whole, whole adulthood practitioner of network weaving. She's the community manager at Ramp Network. And I love this new picture you threw into the thing, Sarah, and I'll let you explain it. And but so just um, much, much appreciation for Sarah and the work she does and our collaboration. Oh, and one last thing I wanted to say about her map is it's one of the um, the one of the most the maps that's the oldest in terms of when we started mapping, what we've learned together, how long we've been working on this map together. So um, you get you, there's a lot of history here, which is good good for this session. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and stop talking and Sarah, take it away. Well, hello, good morning, everybody. I see so many familiar faces today, so that's awesome. You know, I should have corrected something on the slide that Christine was showing because it displayed my email address, and you should not email me. Uh, I am leaving on a sabbatical, so I will not be back around until 
January 17th. So if you're interested in follow-up about anything, you're going to have to hold it until January because I'll be unavailable. Uh, but outside of that, you are welcome to contact me at any time. I'm always happy to share what we're doing um, and to talk deeper one-on-one -on -one with folks to help build the field um, along with Christine and everybody else here. Um, you know, I, I, again, I've seen a lot of your faces before, so you should be excited because you're not going to hear the same old presentation that you normally hear from me because we have a new map. Uh, so this is actually really exciting for me because this is something we've been working on for um, a number of years. Um, and we've been really hung up on some data management that has kind of held us back. But, you know, coming into this year, we knew that we needed to do a reform of the map. Like the map was old, it was outdated. We only had like a fraction of the people on the map. Like we know it needed a major refresh. Then I'm also in charge of hosting our annual meeting planning committee. And as we talked about what type of things we wanted to see happen at the meeting, bless their hearts, they all said, hey, Sarah, we want to see the network map at the annual meeting, which got me so excited. Although then when I asked them who wanted to help me think through what that actually meant and looked like, um, it, was, it was silence. But that's okay, because there were some heroes of the day being the community of practice that we're in right now. So I, I tapped into folks in a deep dive session. And, you know, we contracted with Christine and Tim to not only do some technical work on our map, but I also had weekly meetings uh, with Christine. So we were just in really deep partnership for probably the last like four months or so leading into this annual meeting. And what you see here on the screen now, this is a mural board that we were using at the community of practice. But a lot of these inputs, these goals and questions, like this was a lot of the work that Christine and I did over the months of just getting clear about what it is that we wanted to show in this map, what was going to matter to our members, what is the context of the meeting, you know, really trying to get clear about those goals and what we wanted to explore together. Then we engaged this community of practice. And these folks had some really great, cool ideas of what we could do actually at the meeting with the map to engage people. You know, and then from there, again, like Christine and I kind of picked up our weekly meetings, you know, and kind of kept refining some of these ideas and the technical work that it would take to produce them when the meeting came. So, you know, we kind of, we would get clearer, we would do a little testing, we'd get a little clearer again, do some more testing and thinking, and then when it came time for the annual meeting, honestly, what I did was I prayed that everything worked out well. Um, and I'm grateful to say that it did. So, you know, just a quick reminder for those of you who aren't familiar with the REAMP network, I know it'll take a minute for my slides to load here, um, but we are a network of nonprofits here in the upper Midwest. We have 140 member organizations, nearly 500 individuals who are part of the network. And these folks are all working um, to think systemically and act collaboratively to equitably eliminate greenhouse gas emissions. As Christine mentioned, you know, we were one of the first generative social impacts that came around. And back in 2004, the way that we got our launch was through a year-long systems mapping process. And this systems approach that we've taken to think about how we tackle energy has proved to be invaluable in a number of ways. And that led us, you know, back in 2017, 2018 to get into the mapping because we thought, hey, like, let's take this practice um, to ourselves. What, we, what might we learn about ourselves that's different? And, you know, our initial mapping really did help us. It helped us, you know, understand the network better. It helped us be more strategic in our connections. It helped us be, you know, better at recruiting people. Uh, we were able to target programs and services better. We were able to reflect as a network as a whole. You know, we really wanted to kind of bring some fun into this meeting. That was one of the takeaways that we had. So one of the ways that we had fun at the meeting was we actually used memes like this. You know, we wanted to remind people that this was a living map, right? It's not a static idea that, like, ooh, I went and, like, gave my data. I told people about my connections. I'm done. No, like, this is always going to be a continual work in progress. The other thing that we did, too, was, like, again, like, thinking about the context of our annual meeting, we just wanted to get really focused and clear about what – we have a lot of data. We have a lot of ways of seeing into the network, but what ones made sense for the annual meeting? What we landed on um, was really kind of three things, two of which you see um, displayed here. One was our member directory. 
Uh, another was a showcase view of our strategic priorities. The third one was actually some time tagging that we are doing, um, kind of looking at the network as a whole. I'm going to actually show you each of these and talk about them a little bit deeper. So for those of you who are a little bit newer into this, you can get a little taste of some of the sense making that we do as we look at these maps. You know, one of the other things too, again, like thinking about how to make this fun and how to get people to give you some information besides memes, we also did skits. So while we were in the run of show, like while the meeting was going on, we had a new program manager who was hired, and him and I ran a little skit to use the member directory in the context of his work. Really kind of inspire people to, um, to think about using that member directory for themselves. Um, okay, this is where I wanted to stop sharing this map. Uh, hang on a second. Let me kind of go over here. Okay. You know, one thing I will say that I wish we would have done differently at the meeting is I think we did a really great job of finding the right size of um, pieces of the map that we really wanted to focus in on. And I think we did a great job of tying them to the meeting overall because our meeting is, of course, all about helping people build connections. And that's where this member directory came in to be so valuable because, again, there's 500 people in RAMP. You don't know who you want to know yet but you probably have a set of criteria that you would want to find people in, right? Like, hey, I'm working with rural communities in Minnesota, and this is my first REAMP annual meeting. I don't know anybody else working in Minnesota in this area. How could I use the map to find that? Well, you know, we can use the map and do that filtering. You know, we can get a much smaller universe of people to look at. You may notice in the views I'm showing you right now that I've removed people's faces, and that's just really for privacy um, concerns on our network. But, you know, again, like this member directory for our members, especially for those who are newest, for people who are kind of coming in and seeing a map for the first time, this member directory is something that they can really understand and connect with. Something we've learned from this community of practice was we had a member directory previously that included relationships. And that just made it a little overwhelming to look at. Again, especially think about this from the lens of somebody who's new. So really grateful for some of the learning that's come through this community because it actually helped inform the way that we laid out our maps and our views um, for our members to kind of step into. So really want to thank the community for that. But, you know, again, so we really, you know, wanted to work hard on this member directory view. This was something we showcased. We used a skit for it. Something else that we did as well is we actually gave prizes to people for doing things with the maps. So especially when it came time to giving us information about how they were connected to others, uh, we drew random prize winners throughout the meeting and even after um, to really kind of thank people uh, for their work to do that. Um, so that was the member directory view. The other thing that our annual meeting was really about was we, it was about our strategic priorities. We have five strategic priorities in REAMP. And our conversation at the annual meeting was about them as well as the intersection between them. So we actually left people at the meeting the last day with a call to action, uh, which was, hey, so this meeting was all about finding the intersection between priorities. And your job now is to think about where your work might intersect with somebody else's work and use the network map to find them. Right? If you're working in transportation, you probably don't know a lot of people working on buildings. But we know, especially when we think about things like climate action plans, that there is a connection there. So use the map. Find those folks who are working on buildings, maybe in your state as a place to start, and go have a conversation with them, right, and see where there may be some overlap between your work and how you could be more collaborative and more aligned and more impactful together. So we really kind of made a call to action for that. Um, then the second thing we really wanted to focus on at the annual meeting was about those strategic priorities that I mentioned. Because, you know, we are all about the three C's in REAMP, connections, co-creating strategy, and capacity building. So we're very interested to know how we're doing, especially in terms of relationship building within those priorities. So this first view we looked at was energy democracy. For those of you who have seen REAMP's previous maps, you may have remembered seeing a view that we looked at decarbonizing the power sector, very similar I would say in terms of, uh, uh, you know, people who would say indicate that they worked in that area. And so this was the most robust view out of all five of our strategic priorities. Again, not surprising, given the long history we have working on this, 
we have a lot of people, a lot of relationships, a lot of folks centrally located, because as you become more connected, that's where you become, uh, that's where you start to live in the network. Um, one of the things that we did notice between this map and our previous one was that the core was really spread out in this view. And at first it was like, oh no, like, did we do something wrong? What happened? But the reason that it, that occurred is because, as I mentioned earlier, we only had about a quarter of the people on the map, like 125. And so for the annual meeting, though, we added everybody to the map. So as we added 493 individuals to the map, it just spread the map out. So visually, it spread out the core a little bit. But overall, we feel like we're doing a fairly good job in this priority. In our transportation priority, again, this is another story I know I've told to this community of practice, because when we had seen this back in 2018, we only had a handful of people working in this area and a handful of connections. Uh, it was weak. It really caused us to do a lot more to recruit people with that expertise, you know, to find more ways to, like, get people connected, doing joint actions, things like that. And we're seeing that impact in this map already. We have more people with this expertise in our network today than we did in 2018. We have more connections this time around than we did in 2018. And we still have more work to do, of course, like the job's never done. But we can see that we are making progress in this priority, and we're going to continue to find ways to keep building this core of transportation in our network. After all, it's 30% of all the emissions. So when we looked at buildings, you know, this is an area where for RIA, like, we haven't quite landed on what our niche is. We're a collaborative network. We do not want to be duplicative. And there are several efforts happening, even here in the Midwest, to work to decarbonize buildings. So it's been a little messy for us to figure out, and I think that shows here in the map. I mean, we do have somewhat of a core of people, but we have a lot more work to do, I think, to learn about what the people around the edges are doing who we don't have any connection or relationship with or are even just very loosely connected. Like, I think we have a lot more work to do here to get a shared understanding of the work that's happening and what ways REAMP could be supporting these people within this priority. One of our newest priorities in REAMP is around agriculture. Um, which seems kind of silly since we're Midwest, but it wasn't until uh, a couple of years ago through some analysis that we realized what an outsized impact we were having in this area in particular. So we recently did a report and launched a, a hub, and all of that happened within the last year. And I think that shows up here in the map, right? Like people are very scattered throughout this map. There are a couple of little clusters, if you can see here, that are starting to form, right, of connections. But we have a lot more work to do here to just kind of build relationships between people in this priority. And I'm sure in doing so, we're going to get a better understanding of the work that everybody's doing as well. And that can continue to help us, like, build more cohesiveness in this priority. But, yeah, little hubs forming, but more work to do. Then our last priority that we went and looked at was this integrated voter engagement. And we know from our network already that this is the area where we have the fewest number of people working on. I think that shows up here in the map. What we found interesting in this map, though, is like there were a few people that were very clear hubs, like this person right here. And there's somebody over here as well that aren't staff. Um, for those of you who are newer to reading maps, your staff, as you fill out connections and stuff, your staff are almost always going to end up centrally located, right, because you're some of the most connected people in the network. Um, so I'm kind of, like, not interested in where they're at, but these are members of ours. And so it got us wondering, you know, for people who do see themselves in this position, where they're a hub, where they're a bridge, where they're a bottleneck, you know, what could they do personally to help catalyze connections around them? right, and help kind of build that cohesiveness within um, the overall structure of the network. So this was um, the view that this was the view that we looked at on the third day. So as we came into the map, as we came into the annual meeting, uh, again, we had about 123 people on the map. And when the slide shows up, you'll see that this is what the network structure looked at. So that's what happened then. Then as we approached the annual meeting, what we did was through some data synchronization, like some data work, we got everybody loaded on the map. So when we got everybody loaded on the map, we went to 493 people on the map. Whoa, okay. Definitely made it more robust. 
And again, like that was largely due to people um, just, we just kind of uploaded their, their information to the, the map. Something else that we did too to kind of help populate the member directory was our registration form actually mirrored the questions of the survey of some apps. So they were exactly the same. So as people were registering for the annual meeting, they were already answering all those questions. So when we loaded their data, we already had their survey filled out for them, their, their bio or basically the information about them. So that really helped make that member directory more robust. So then as we got close to the... Can I just make one small? So as Sarah is moving through these time tags and showing you what the network looked at at T1 like looked like at T1 and T2 and T3. The 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 visual of the map is helpful, but also notice down in the lower right, there's it has the counts and the connections and the density and the reciprocity. And so as we're going through time tagging, we're actually looking at how those numbers change. I just want to point that little technical bit out, Sarah. Okay, I'm shutting up. You go, you go. <laughs> no, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we had all the people, right? We got all the people loaded pre-annual meeting, like just before, about the week before, we got everybody loaded into the map, making sure everything's working well. Um, then we started asking people to give us connection data. We said, hey, we're going to be using this at the meeting. We want you to come in and give the data. I mean, a few people gave some connection data, not very many. I think we had like 15 before the meeting started. Uh, but still, 15 people cared enough to like come in and give connection data. Awesome. Um, but then after we showed the map and talked about it, like during the welcome session, throughout the meeting, we kept sending people reminders to fill out their connections and why it mattered. Because we were going to be looking at those showcase views that I just showed you. We were looking at those on Friday. So like, look, we need you to give us this data by Thursday night because Friday we're looking at it, okay? Um, and that really did actually help drive people to give data. I think during the annual meeting, 70 people gave data to the map. And we only had 150 at the meeting, and that included presenters. I just want so, to, I mean, I, I want to amplify a piece of that. They sent out an invitation twice a day, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, they didn't, they, so they, so Sarah brought it up repeatedly, and then they sent out an invitation twice a day. And that behavior is a behavior that I always run into resistance because people will say, oh my God, they'll be so annoyed. It's so annoying that we don't want to, we don't want to, you know, piss them off. And, and uh, actually uh, my, I've all, my stance has always been, it's just do it, but they just about never do. And Sarah did, and it went, worked really great. So um, just pointing that out, that was, that was a, what she did was, a, yeah. was not intuitive, not, you know, generally considered acceptable behavior, but it worked. <laughs> well, and it was at the meeting, right? So in the messages yeah. that we had designed some apps to kick out, we said that, like, look, we know we're bugging you. And that's because we need this information because we're yeah. looking at it on Friday. So come in and tell us what you know. Okay. It's actually very important for you to do that. So we did. We even chatted out the link, the find my some app link during the live session. So as I was talking, somebody else was sending out the chat. Then we'd go on break. And just before break, we'd make an announcement and say, so just so you know, we're going to be sending you your link for the network map. We need you to tell you, tell us about your connections. So we told people and we did it. We annoyed them. Christine, to your point, I did have one person out of 493 who said, take me off the list. That's okay. But I also had like five people who emailed me to say, hey, actually like these three people who got this email aren't with our network anymore, aren't with our organization anymore. I'm like, oh, that's actually really helpful. I'm gonna go do some data cleanup now too. So, you know, it worked out both ways. What was cool, so here we are on day, like just before the annual meeting. So like, let's pretend that like the annual meeting, it's the day of the annual meeting, but we haven't started the first session yet. And again, we have everybody on the map. We have about 18, 1900 connections. Um, made right now. By day three of the annual meeting, da, 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 we were up to over 3,000 connections. So we doubled, almost doubled our connections um, in the three days of our annual meeting to produce this map. And you'll notice it really did make a big difference for the folks who were like floating out in space who had no connection, like that population shrunk in half. You know, and we can start to see a lot more connectedness of what's happening here. For us, for REAMP, 
we are most excited about this because now we actually feel like we have a baseline to look at. You know, we talk about networks building relationships and connectivity all the time. Now we actually have data to back that claim up. And that's going to be a big deal for us. I think as we continue to move forward, it's something that I'm personally interested in because I'm director of community management, is I actually want to do some filtering in my map and looking at the strength of connection and in particular helping people get connected because we ask folks who you might want to be introduced to, right? So I need to be spending time going into the map, looking at that data and helping those people forge connections. And ideally, then following up and reminding them, hey, like if you guys did make some relationships or connect, you should go update your, your information in the, in the network map for us as well. But, you know, that's something that we want to continue to do. But this, is, this, is a, this time tagging view, this is something we are going to show at every single annual meeting going forward. I can almost guarantee it. Because it's definitely a way for us to reflect as a network overall on how we're doing. And I think those strategic priorities, that is also a, the annual meeting, Again, like thinking about the, the, the venue and the audience, like that's a great time for us to be reflecting overall as a network on how we're doing within our priorities. And the member directory, like that is there for everybody every time. I've even instructed a couple of folks on staff to, you know, making sure that they're just prepared and okay to use that view at least to help members connect um, while I'm gone as well. Because that's the most fundamental view that people really want to use. Um, but when we're thinking about like us together overall, that's where this time tagging view and looking at that showcase view of our strategic priorities just, just really come, come, in, um, come into play. So, you know, I would say, again, like sort of just like in summary, you know, it's kind of, it's actually not much different than, you know, when we started mapping to begin with. You know, we kind of had to start small and you, there's a lot of testing and back and forth that has to happen. You can't do it alone. You got to include other people. And you really just have to be thinking deeply about your audience, right? Like in this time and place, like what matters most to these people? What makes the most sense? Because it's very easy to overwhelm people with all this. So you really just want to find that right size, bite-sized chunk that just makes sense. And I mean, again, like I can't thank the community of practice enough because they were incredibly valuable, you know, and I can't obviously thank Christine and Tim enough for the work that they've been doing, you know, on, on this as well, because none of this is possible without them. Thank you, Sarah. That was great. I I just want to acknowledge something. We were sort of joking about this earlier. Sarah is a master at breaking things down into the right bite-sized pieces. And uh, I've, I've, I've started to think of her recently. We were working together and I was like, you're just like a kindergarten teacher. You know, you're always enthusiastic and you don't mind repeating things and you, you know, you break it down and you make it easy and you make it fun and funny. And uh, I just really appreciate that because I am not like that. I'm much more like your dour PhD professor who drones on and on and on very complex things. <laughs> so, so we're sort of at opposite ends of the spectrum. <laughs> and, uh, and it's just really refreshing to, 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 to work with Sarah and, and learn how she thinks by planning things together with her. Um, but so... We've got 20 minutes, questions. I'm guessing there were some places in that that some of you may have some really fundamental basic questions about like what, what was, so feel free to ask really basic questions, but also all other questions are welcome to. I'm just trying to say, don't feel like any question is too dumb or too basic because that's what we're here for today. So- um, For sure. Whoever's, and I see Brian's hands up, so we'll go to Brian, but after that, let's just go ahead and, Okay, hands up is fine. We'll, we'll go in order. <laughs> um, the, the people who use the map at the, uh, uh, the meeting, how generally familiar are they with working with the map? Is this something that most people who use it were already familiar and comfortable with it? Or was this something that people first time came on and uh, you uh, needed maybe some guidance or you, know, uh, you had to make the map simple enough to, to get in? Good question. Yeah. You know, Brian, I, I, I did say this in the presentation. I don't feel like we gave enough time for people to play with the map in real time. And I wish we would have done that. I wish in the, we would have done like, hey, here's the directory view. We're sending you the link right now. And I'm going to give you 10 minutes. And I want you to find somebody, you know, in this way. Like, yeah. I wish we would have done that. Because I don't think people are 
going like they went in and gave us like information, but I don't know how much they actually played around with the map. And I think at our some of the people were coming to their very first reamp meeting, so they had yeah. not had much experience with the map whatsoever. Yeah. yeah so going that. forward, I don't know if people are going to be using it, and that's why I was like, hey, like Connor, Erica, how do you guys feel about this? Cool. Like we want to drive people to you, you know. Mm-hmm. as they have questions about connecting and finding people in the, in the network. Are you okay with it? And they were okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Rebecca. I, I was just reflecting as I was listening to you on Sarah, how you introduced me to the uh, different roles associated with using network mapping and uh, um, thought, it would help me to hear again how many of those roles you've been playing and what you think is ideal for that sort of team yep. role. Mm. So ideally, it is a team. Oh, Rebecca, I would love to have a team. It might be like part of my goals for next year to see if I can pull together like my own little mapping team in the network. So, you know, I have folks in Reamp to talk to um, because while people have been really like interested and excited about it, I think. I get the sense that they're just like very overwhelmed with their regular programmatic work that they aren't really interested in like going deep into the mapping, which is okay. You know, it's, it's, it's all right. Um, but, you know, I think in order to produce a map and to use a map, like we're using it, there are three hats that you have to wear, right? Somebody has got to have a vision for it, right? And that drive, you know, and, and help you move it along. Somebody has got to be the technical person, right? Like Kumu just doesn't do things magically for you. Somebody has got to make those views happen. And then somebody's got to spend time looking at the map and making sense of it. So for me personally, like I'm happy to wear a visioning hat and a sense making hat. Um, as I said, we contracted with Christine and Tim to do the technical aspect of it because I don't have that skill set and nobody in my network does either. So for us, it's just easier to, to contract with that. And then Christine, I wonder what your thoughts are on which of those roles is more or less challenging to find. Good question. Yeah, uh, I would say they're all challenging. <laughs> um, I mean, every so some of them are like the technical role to get really good at it requires repeated exposure to the tools, especially to Kumu. I mean, some app is basically a survey tool. So if you're used to setting up a survey, some app is not that challenging, but Kumu is very, can be very, it's very robust. There's a lot of potential in it. It's really easy to do it. If you do it once a year to be kind of starting from scratch every time you do it, because if you don't do it repeatedly, you don't remember all the little ifs, ands, or buts. So that is a little bit tricky, but um, so I would say there are fewer technical people in the community, fewer people who actually know how to put together a Mm -hmm. map in Kumu, but in the big picture, that's the easy part. <laughs> that's like the part that does. <laughs> I mean, it is because the part of like helping people even understand the value of it is very challenging, as I'm sure most of you know. And the part of like learning how to actually get a lot of value from the map by doing sense making takes a different mindset than the mechanized mindset we've been raised with. And so uh, those are actually, I feel like, take a lot longer and need more repeated exposure um, to really, I mean, I'm still learning both of those. And I've been doing this work for eight years now with this tool and um, or seven, but, um, and I still feel like I, I totally don't get it. Like I feel frustrated and totally out of my depth most of the time, not to be discouraging. I'm sure I'm sounding discouraging, but I'm just saying it's new, you know, it's very bleeding edge. And it's fun and fascinating and interesting, but it's not uh, like falling off a log. And the technical piece is the easiest of all of them because you don't actually have to think that deeply about systems. You just have to know how to do a few, a little bit of coding. And I just want last thing piece to throw in is, is so those are the three hats that I kind of came up with in the beginning, in the very beginning, when I started trying to work with clients and articulate what parts they could take over and what parts they couldn't because I was finding we we had different expectations about what roles would be. 
So I articulated that, but in the last year, I have been realizing there's a fourth role that has not been in, in lived into by anybody yet, but that I think would be really, really valuable, which is a storyteller role. So someone who tells the story of why we, like Sarah does a little storytelling when she's sharing her presentation. She's saying sort of why we needed to go here, what made us think about this, what was missing from our lives before we did this, then the story of how we did this, because it's a story of collaboration. It's a story of thinking across differences and then be able to tell the story of what is, you know, what are we learning from our sense making? How is that changing our working? The, the storytelling, I think, is actually the key to all the rest of it. It's what will pull all the rest of it together and make it meaningful to most of the population, because every network has people like Sarah who, who see the value, who are inherently systems thinkers and inherently understand why this is important. But you know, 90% of the network doesn't see the value at first, is not, I mean, they might get it and, they, 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 and they'll get, you know, some, some people will be enthusiastic, but a, a large portion just don't get it. But if, you, if they hear stories, if they're hearing stories over and over, then they start to realize, well, even if I'm not gonna use it, it's valuable and important for me to keep it up to date. I get why I should keep it up to date. If, if you just get to a, a minimum of that, of most people feeling like, yeah, there's, a, there's value in keeping this up to date, um, then you have a lot more to work with. And I think the storytelling role is crucial to all of that. And just sort of weaving those stories into, you know, like how Sarah sort of weaves a bit of the story into everything she does and weaving those into you, you know, however you're communicating, wherever you're communicating, stories about successes are good. So that was one wounded. Eva, you had your hand up for a moment. I, did you, and then you took it down. Did you have a, a question? I do, thank you. This is great, Sarah, and congratulations. Um, I'm, I really appreciate this on a Monday morning. I'm like excited now and using the tool. Um, can you share a little bit about when you're in the process of, of doing the the mapping with folks and they can see like how their network is growing the connections that you make for them to see like this is the value of it that like kind of because I, I think where i sometimes get lost when i'm using a, a map like this is making those connections for the folks above the now you see it right like look how big our network is but like these are the benefits of this this is how this can be used like do you do that with them the day of or is that part of your sense making meeting where you connect those dots for the for the group yeah you know it's a hard question to answer because i think it comes in it comes into play in a variety of ways like some people do get to experience like the value of it directly, right? Like I have people who say, hey, Sarah, I'm looking to find people who are working on utility scale solar and we're meeting one-on-one -on -one, and we're helping them find those people and then I'm introducing them. And we do this with some forms of collaboration as well. We have these things called action teams. So if somebody has an idea for an action team and they haven't like applied for funding yet, you know, I'll reach out to them and be like, hey, I saw that you were interested in this rights of nature action team. You know, how about we sit down at the, like, do you have a team of people already? No, like, let's sit down together and use the map and see who else might be interested in this action team and applying with you. You know, in some cases, we're doing it at a larger scale, right? So I show the map during an orientation. Um, and that's where we also see some of these, like, connection questions start to populate. That's why I said our member directory, it's the most fundamental view that we have, and it's probably the most used view um, that, we, that we use in the map. Um, because it was so funny when we started showing the map in an orientation, like people actually started to understand what the network is, which seems so silly, but there's so much going on in ramp. It's so big. It's so complex that when they saw the people and their faces, they were like, oh, it's just a collection of human beings, actually, you know, and it just kind of generates that stuff. You know, and in some cases, we've done like sense making and we've done it in a smaller group. Um, you know, Christine actually worked with one of our previous staff people to test a theory we had about a form of collaboration we were supporting. Like, was this a, having the intended impact in the network that we thought it was? Um, and in the story that I've told about the annual meeting, you know, we've really been reflecting on the network as a whole. We did this in 2018 and 2019, and I can't remember which year it was, 
But we had looked at the changing transportation options view in, in, as a showcase view. And it was actually seeing that view that caused us to do a number of things. We went out and started intentionally recruiting people with this expertise to the network. We decided that we needed a hub for people who are working on transportation to connect and gather. And we started getting involved in things like Transit Equity Day. Like, it just really caused us to be far more intentional than we ever had been. We've been working on transportation since, like, 2010, you know, and it was doing terrible when you looked at the map compared to the other priorities. And as I showed you today, like, we've made a big difference from that 2018, 2019 view in terms of transportation. Like, that priority <laughs> has had more change in, in it over the last two years than any other one. And it was a result of kind of doing that sense making together. And then together, we were trying to make a difference overall in the network. Hope that answered your question. And then, Natalia, do you, would you um, like to say your question out loud so Sarah can hear it and answer it? I hope that my uh, audio comes through because sometimes it's a bit wonky. It's but, very good. Uh, okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for holding the session. Um, I really love a uh, chance for the system to see themselves. And uh, when people switch roles, they might be working for government or they might be part of a band council. Uh, does the system somehow update that? Um, so when they're marked as a node, are they marked as an individual or can they be marked as an organization? Mm, good question. We had a long conversation when we started mapping about how we were going to map, right? Did we want to map the individuals in our network or did we want to map our members, which are technically organizations? And at the end of the day, we landed on individuals. And for us, the reason that we chose to do that is because we just recognized how important that like person-to-person -person interaction was. Like an organization and organization relationship for us, like what we've seen, didn't really matter because if like somebody left who held that relationship, like that relationship with the organization left with them as well. So we're more interested in that than organizations. We might map organizations in the future. I don't know, maybe, um, but we're more interested in that. When somebody switches, um, we can update them, you know, to make sure that they're working in the right state, like all their like details are correct you know, and update the organization that they're working for. If they leave the network, like they've left that organization, they aren't even with a member organization anymore, we remove them from the map. Gone, you're gone. Our map is private, it's for members only. I'm gonna add a little bit to that. So that's the context for Sarah's network. So every network is different. Yeah. And, um, uh, but you can, in some map, you can map individuals and organizations now, which wasn't an option when we first started Sarah's map. And um, and so, but I, I, and, and depending on the context, it may be that you don't, you still want to keep, uh, keep connected to that person, even if they are in a different organization, because they still have the same values and the same, you know, perp, if they're still working on the same things, you're just sort of spreading your influence into a new organization. And, and so you might want to keep that if you use the dual elements functionality in some app, you can actually just move them to a different, you can, you can track the whole change um, and see, see how things are moving. But um, it really is contextual, I would say, that what, what's how you choose if you're just gonna do one element, whether you do people or organizations. I tend to prefer people if you're just gonna do one myself for the same reasons that Sarah said, um, but sometimes that's not the way it's gonna work. Tommy, you've got a question. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sarah. It's good to see someone on the point of all this. Um, during the meeting, did you have any anecdotal or just ahas or people just say, oh, I got it. I mean, I like to hear just some stories of where people it clicked and they came rang up to you. Like, hopefully there's some of them. Yeah, <laughs> it didn't really happen at the annual meeting. But again, like I didn't feel like we did our job in terms of giving people that space to do that like engagement and sense making for themselves. Like that was a meeting design flaw on my part. Um, you know, I'm really gonna take, I, I made a note in the debrief already. Cause I was like, we need to do that differently next year. So the most time I get the ahas from people again, like it's the orientation. That's where people are like, oh, oh, and now they're thinking and they wanna know things. Or if I do like some of that targeted outreach again, like if I know that something's starting to brew in the network and I do some targeted outreach, like then I can people get people in and then they're excited and they're engaged, but otherwise they're like, blah. 
when we did start mapping, though, Tom, so like back in 2017 when we had this idea of like doing the network map, we launched a peer learning circle. So we had like eight members who out of 500 who were really into like wanted to learn more about mapping. And, you know, through the six months that we worked together, like they were a great sounding board because I was trying to develop this network map. And so as I would like learn about things that month and then I'd go play around and test things in the map, I could bring it back to the group. And they were a great sounding board. They helped us get much more clarity about like how people want to connect, why they want to connect, you know, what we would want to know or information we want to collect about each other because we were able to go through this iteration together with a group of the willing before we rolled it, before we even invited those 125 people to the network initially, or to the map initially. That was very, very useful. If I was doing it again, definitely would do that all over again. Great, thank you. Vicki. Yeah, so um, that's interesting uh, because I think as you work with the map and you have this, team that's going through the reiterations of what kind of questions you want to ask, you know, the tendency is to go for more and more granular material. But when you come in, you know, you don't see that um, you're not kind of like really aware where the refinement is. And um, everything's kind of equal value in terms of information. So I like the fact that you put in strategic priorities. It gives a sense of where the focus is for people. Um, but um, I'm wondering where you find this sweet spot between, because sometimes even, you know, when I've been into the community of practice map, there's just too many categories to look at, you know, and people, yeah, I wonder. So is there a way to, is there any sense of really how many answers to a specific question and how many questions? And uh, I would say that you would have to gather up a group, small group of folks in your network and answer that for yourself. Because I mean, as Christine said, like everybody's different, you know, and, you know, we're a very tight-knit community in REAMP, and we have very defined, like, parameters, like who's in, who's out, what are we working on, what are we not working on, like, what are our shared values. So, like, we have a lot of clarity and a lot of boundary in that sense. And so because of that, like, that's why we were able to do that. But what we did for ourselves doesn't mean that that's going to work for you. The only thing I would say would work for you is, like, you need to talk to people in your network, and you're going to have to just test it out, right? Like, you have an idea, like, go ahead and try it, and then have folks test it and see what happens. Because that's what we did in the peer learning circle. Sometimes people would test things that we added or another dimension or whatever. And they'd be like, that meant nothing to me, not useful. Okay, let's get rid of that. Um, seemed like a great idea. Turned out it wasn't. In other cases, like, I don't know, maybe this is a good idea. And then we'll play it out. and We'll be like, wow, that was a great idea. We definitely want to incorporate that. So it's just like that trial and error, honestly. So we're at the top of the hour. I'm going to... Um... Uh, have us close up. I should have sort of forewarned a little bit ahead of time, but anyway. Um, so if you, we'll do what now is we'll do our, um, we have a goodbye ritual. Before I say the goodbye ritual, I just want to say thank you all for um, for being for being with us and for asking questions and and for your attention and your time and your all the work that you already do that leads you to this place of having this curiosity. And um, so thank you all so much for that. And our goodbye ritual is uh, you can all unmute start you can start doing that now if you want to do this it's very simple i'm going to count down three two one in just a moment and then we all just all together give each other our blessings and our greetings for the day all at once we're just going to talk all at the same time and just then jump off i'll stay on sarah will stay on so if you have more questions you want to keep chatting just don't jump off but we're going to close this portion and and and, and so Three, ready? Three, <laughs> two, one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yay. <laughs>